Are you afraid of anesthesia? Are anesthesia related concerns the biggest things holding you back from facial cosmetic surgery? Well, we fear most what we don't understand. So today I'm going to go over in-depth facial cosmetic surgery anesthesia 101. This is going to be a detailed presentation. I'm going to give it in layman's terms. I'm going to be very descriptive, but I want to tell you I'm not an anesthesiologist. I'm not an anesthetist. I am a simple country facial plastic surgeon. I have, however, maintained hospital privileges to do sedation for almost 20 years now. I've supervised nurse anesthetists delivering deep sedation for about 15 years now. And this is a day-to-day -day part of my life. Now, there's going to be oversimplifications in here. Um, I'm definitely going to skip some things and omit some things intentionally or unintentionally. I'm going to say some things that other doctors, other anesthetists may find controversial. And so this is just my opinion and this is my take on these matters. If you are really considering these procedures, I strongly urge you to discuss the anesthetic component of your procedure with your anesthesia provider and or your surgeon. So with that, let's get started. The word anesthesia, where does it come from? It comes from the Greek meaning without and anesthesia, sensation, without sensation. And so anesthesia aims to create the loss of sensation. Depending on what kind of anesthesia you have, there may or may not also be alteration or loss of consciousness. And we're going to get to that in a little more detail. The primary types of anesthesia are local, and local means confined to a small area. So this diagram over here, it's not exactly right, but it shows you local being one arm. Okay, so that's more of a regional, but let's say local would be if you infiltrated a little bit into your cheek or infiltrated a little bit into a tooth. That's local. Regional is more one section of the body. And so a lot of times people are very familiar with regional anesthetics from having their epidural put in or maybe having a spinal anesthetic for knee surgery or hip surgery. General anesthesia is the entire body, your entire system is anesthetized. It's general. And so those are the three main types of anesthesia. So local anesthesia can be achieved by topical, so like lidocaine jelly, for instance. It can be achieved injectably. It can even be achieved by cold, ice, ice cold. Regional anesthesia typically requires an injection. So an injection to inject into where the nerve comes out that serves your upper lip, or an injection into your back, into the spinal area where the nerves that serve the lower body are. Um, systemic anesthesia, the medication has to get into your system. And the main ways that we do that are either inhalational, like gases or nitric oxide, oral that you swallow, transmucosal, something that you either use a suppository or an oral pill and let it absorb, or maybe an anesthetic eye drop, let it absorb, and intravenous, so IV medications. There's another thing that's not really anesthesia, we'll call it neuromodulation, and that's things like vibration and things like calming touches from the provider and from the support team or supportive words, talk anesthesia, those things actually really count. So especially when you're under sedation or light sedation, those adjunctive measures can actually really help. So let's get into local anesthetics. There was one original local anesthetic and it's the only natural local anesthetic and that's cocaine. Cocaine numbs tissues and it's obviously an extract, an alkaloid extract of the coca leaf. It numbs tissues and it is still used to this day in mucosal anesthesia, sometimes in nasal surgery. I don't use it anymore, but some doctors still do. Um, it can also be used in ocular surgery. So all the other local anesthetics that you've heard of, lidocaine, bupivacaine, which are also go by the names Marcaine and uh, Xylocaine, um, those are synthetic local anesthetics. And lidocaine is the one that I use most frequently in my office. It has the highest safety profile. Um, it's relatively short acting. So we supplement that with bupivacaine, also known as Marcaine. Um, that drug has, we can't use as much of it, but we often use it towards the end of surgery to put in a block to help keep the field numb for a long time. So after, after rhinoplasty, for instance, my patients will often report that their upper lip is numb the night of surgery. And they'll be like, wow, it feels like I went to the dentist. How long is that going to last? And I'll, I kind of joke. I say it's like an epidural for your face. We're trying to keep that numb after the surgery so that by the time the numbing wears off, the pain's already over underneath it. We try to use fewer systemic medications that way. Sometimes people will tell me that they are allergic to local anesthesia. And I'll get into that a little more and I'll say, well, what happened? And I'll say I went to the dentist and I got injected. And when I got injected, I had a reaction. My heart rate went up. 
I got real anxious, I got real sweaty. Well, a lot of local anesthetics that we use in both dentistry and medicine are supplemented with epinephrine. And the word epinephrine means epi above nephros, the kidney. It's a compound that is actually secreted by your adrenal gland. Adrenal means add next to renal kidney. So epinephrine, adrenaline, they're the same drug. Adrenal gland, epinephrine gland, they're the same gland. That molecule, epinephrine, it does give you that heart racy sensation. Like if you almost get hit by a car and then you get real nervous and anxious, that's epinephrine in your bloodstream that you're feeling. And so to have that feeling when you're injected with local anesthetic is not an allergy. That is an expected effect of epinephrine to bring your pulse rate up, your blood pressure up. Um, why do we use it if it has those side effects? Well, it constricts blood vessels and it limits bleeding in the surgical field so that we can do a really precise job, minimize blood loss, but more importantly, see what we're doing around vital structures. So epinephrine is a medication that we use commonly with local anesthetics. If you've had a high racing heartbeat or pounding in your chest, that kind of thing, that's not necessarily allergy. There are true allergies to local anesthetics. Um, those true allergies are more hives and wheezing and rashes and that kind of thing. Um, Usually, if you're allergic to one family of local anesthetics, say the amino esters, you can be given safely the other family of anesthetics, amides, and get away with it. Um, but really, if there's a question of allergy, the thing you should do is get allergy tested by a qualified allergist. Sometimes you can also be allergic to the preservative in local anesthetic. The multi-dose vials are commonly preserved with methylparaben, and a lot of people are paraben allergic. So if you go to your allergist and you get that teased out and it turns out you're paraben allergic, well, that's great. We can just get preservative free lidocaine. It's really hard to come by. It's why it's not used very often. We can find it sometimes and we'll find it for that case. So those are the things that I hear about and I think about when people tell me they're allergic to local anesthesia. So regional anesthesia, we kind of touched on this. Regional anesthesia in the face, what we see most commonly, we'll talk about blocks. Infraorbital block can block this whole green section on the face and make the top lip and the center of the cheek and even a little bit of the lower eyelid numb. A mental nerve block can block the lower lip, some of the chin pad, not quite as much as shown here. And then a frontal uh, supraorbital block can block the forehead region all the way up to the top of the head. There are extra little sections here that don't get controlled by those blocks and we need to do external nasal blocks or zygomatic frontal blocks or something like that. But a block for the most part means putting in lidocaine right where the nerve comes out of the skull and getting a big chunk of tissue to be numb. That can be a great option for, let's say, lip surgery or lip injections in someone that's super, super sensitive, uh, where just the topical numbing cream is inadequate for that person. A block is a good thing. Ring blocks are commonly used in hair transplant. We can put lidocaine all the way around, like a ring around the head, and then the top of the head is numb. So those are the most common blocks that we use in facial surgery. Again, in body surgery, epidural uh, numbing, spinal numbing, those are all kinds of things that um, can be done for blocking whole sections of the body. So when you really think about it, local anesthesia is pretty much a miracle. You inject an area and the area that you inject or the area that that nerve serves goes totally numb and you can operate on it, you can inject it with filler, you can do anything totally painlessly. But it's got some limitations. And the main limitations are, first, when you inject the local anesthesia, if you're doing a small area, you can inject it really slowly and make it relatively painless. But if you're trying to do the whole face and neck, it's a lot to get injected with local anesthesia. The pain of infiltration, there's, there's a lot going on. Secondly, the local anesthesia keeps the tissues numb, but it does nothing for anxiety. It does nothing for restlessness. Some of the procedures I do take two, three, four, five, six, seven hours. And in that case, you just can't lie there comfortably for two hours, three hours, four hours. The tissues are numb, but your body gets restless. Your mind starts to go. Um, that's not a good length of time to do under just local anesthesia. The other thing is there's some tissues you can't reliably get numb with local anesthesia. So when I'm doing a deep neck lift, let's say the glandular tissue isn't always numb when I get to it. And so it's, it wouldn't be comfortable if you are under local anesthesia. When I get to certain parts of the surgery, you would feel pain. And so that would not be very good. 
I also have to go really slow when I'm under local anesthesia. The patient's awake and we have to make sure that we're serving their emotional needs and talking to them and not, not frightening them. And if they get a little worked up, we have to take a little pause. And it can take a two-hour operation and make it a four-hour operation, which isn't good for the surgeon or the patient. The last part is toxicity. There's only so much lidocaine you can safely give. And you know we're taught five or seven milligrams per kilogram in school. In tumescent fashion, it turns out it's closer to 35 or 40 milligrams per kilogram when given tumescently, and that's a whole separate lecture. But there's still a, there's a finite limit to the safe amount of lidocaine that, be, that can be given. And so local anesthesia alone is not adequate for every facial cosmetic surgery. So what happens when local and regional anesthesia are no longer adequate? We move into systemic anesthesia. And systemic anesthesia means we're affecting the entire system, not just a little portion, not just a little locality of your body. And with systemic anesthesia, now your brain is being affected by anesthesia. And that's the goal. So what are the possible components of anesthesia that we might strive for? Well, one in particular that all patients really want is anxiolysis. Anxiolysis has the same root word as anxiety. So anxiety and lysis means uh, cutting of or popping that balloon or getting rid of it, lysing it. So anxiolysis means breaking up your anxiety or, or relieving you of your anxiety. So that's one component of anesthesia we typically want analgesia and without algesia pain we want to be able to limit pain so for instance we're injecting that lidocaine that hurts well if we have something on board systemically to prevent the lidocaine from stinging that's good that's analgesia or we're working on tissues that aren't totally numb the systemic and analgesia helps us get that done sedation hypnosis means gets you sleepy so it's easier to tolerate longer periods of time because you're kind of sleepy drifting in and out Amnesia means you don't even remember much of what's happening there. And I don't mean that you're suffering the whole time and just don't remember. That's a question we get a lot. Are you really awake and just don't remember it? No, if this is done right, you are truly sleepy and you don't feel or remember what's going on because you're pretty sleepy. But if there's a little window where you wrestle or a little restless, it's kind of trippy, dreamy, foggy. It's okay. It's not bright awake and, and feeling anything. Um, I don't need it, but some doctors for body surgery or if they're intubating a patient, need muscle relaxation. That's another component of anesthesia that we sometimes need. But again, for facial surgery, I don't need muscle relaxation. So the things that I'm looking for, keeping the patient calm, low anxiety, comfortable being there for a little while, and not feeling pain if there's an area that's not localized, or um, if there's an area where I'm injecting more lo local anesthesia, more lidocaine, I don't want them to hurt. So everyone says, okay, yeah, I want sedation. Can you just give me a couple pills and knock me out? And then uh, we'll just do it with pills, right? I wish that was the case. Matter of fact, um, we know that's not the case. If it was just so easy to give you a couple pills and knock you out and do everything we want to do, there wouldn't be anesthesia providers. Anesthetists and anesthesiologists be living under bridges all across this country, right? That's not the case. You can't just give someone a couple pills and knock them out and wake them back up. So oral sedation, pills or liquids it's the easiest to administer you have them swallow the pills but it's the hardest to control because between the time you swallow the pill and the time it gets to your brain first it has to go through your digestive system that takes time and you can get really tricked up because 20 30 minutes in they don't feel like they're feeling enough so you give them another pill or two but before you know it they're too sleepy because you haven't let the original dose catch all the way up the second thing that makes it difficult is what's called first pass metabolism. When you swallow a pill or swallow a medication, it goes through your gut and it's absorbed through the wall of the gut. <clears throat> After it's absorbed through the wall of the gut, the very first place it passes through is your liver. And this is a genius, genius thing, whether it's by design or by evolution, your liver detoxifies everything you eat before that medication or that product makes it out to your brain and your kidneys and all the sensitive organs of your system. And so the problem with oral medications, when you swallow them, they get absorbed. As they go through the liver, they get largely taken apart. So the amount that makes it to your brain is much less predictable. There is kind of a way around that, and that's transmucosal. So uh, sometimes we'll give our patients lollipops with medications in them, or we might tell you to crush up a pill and put it under your tongue, let's say when you have aspirin for a heart attack, that kind of stuff, because that 
absorption through the lining doesn't pass the liver. It goes right into the systemic circulation and goes to the brain. So when you have lollipop sedation, for instance, we're taking advantage of that loophole in oral drug delivery. Inhalational antibiotics, inhalational uh, anesthetics work in a similar fashion. You breathe in, they're brought through the linings of the lungs, through the alveoli, and then into the lung circulation now to the brain. Um, so general anesthetics are that way. Or in our office, the one thing that we sometimes use that way is nitrous oxide. We have a Pronox machine that mixes nitrous and oxygen 50-50. And uh, you can get a little bit of analgesia, pain relief, and anxiolysis, anxiety relief, just from breathing nitrous oxide, and that wears off really quickly. But what we really, really count on more than anything is IV sedation. That's what we use in our office, intraven intravenous uh, drug delivery. So what levels of anesthesia are there? And so the levels of anesthesia have nothing to do with the route. It doesn't matter if it's oral, if it's IV, if it's inhaled, you can reach any level of anesthesia through any route. So the first level of anesthesia you might see is minimal sedation or anxiolysis. The person is responsive at a normal level. They're maintaining their airway. They're not snoring. They're not uh, like sleep apnea kind of situation. They're breathing fine and their heart respiratory rate uh, circulation is all fine. And so anxiolysis, you should think of that as, you know, have one glass of wine or maybe two glasses of wine. You're socially kind of happy, but you're perfectly with it. That's anxiolysis. Moderate sedation is you are still pretty awake. You can converse a little bit. You're maintaining your own airway, breathing just fine, no snoring. Um, and this is, this is kind of lighter than people really think it is. People think moderate sedation means you don't know what's going on. Uh, moderate sedation, you're, you're a little more there. Deep sedation, that's where I like to have my patients. And so with deep sedation, uh, you are very sleepy. You really aren't aware enough to form memories. Um, I can inject local anesthetics. I can do things that are a little bit painful. And although you respond a little bit, you're not really aware of it. Um, in deep sedation, we sometimes need to help with the airway. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. But the cardiovascular function is usually maintained. We usually don't need to do blood pressure support or that kind of stuff once in a while. General anesthesia is completely out, all systems off. Your uh, breathing generally needs major intervention, so a breathing tube, which I'll get into in a minute. Sometimes we actually need to use a ventilator to breathe for you because you have muscle relaxation on board or you're, you're so sleepy that your brainstem is getting sleepy and it's not doing pulse and blood pressure management as well. So that's general anesthesia. There are kinds of shades of gray. And what's important, again, to remember is all of these states are reachable by orals or by IV or by inhalational. So it's not like oral always gives you sedation and, gen and inhalation always gives you general. It's all about dosing and titration. And the thing with intravenous sedation, the thing I like about it is the medications we use are so titratable. If you're getting a little sleepy, we can back off on them a little bit. If you're getting a little too alert, we can go forward a little bit. And it's very titratable. It's like a gas stove. Pills are like an electric stove. You know, it takes forever to heat up and it takes forever to cool down. And so I'm not into oral sedation. Finally, if you're doing sedation, you need to be prepared for inadvertently higher or lower levels of anesthesia. So again, if we're striving for deep sedation and the person slips into where they're too sleepy, well, you and the anesthesia team need to be prepared to support them until they come back to the deep sedation stage. So sedation is a real responsibility and it's one that we take really seriously. So let's talk a little bit about airway devices. So when you're sleepy enough, and you've probably seen people, I'm one of them, if I get a little too sleepy, I'll snore, okay? And what's happening is the back of my tongue and my palate will fall back against the back of my throat. And that soft tissue makes you snore and sleep apnea is a situation like that. So one device that we do use commonly in my office is called an oropharyngeal airway. And it's, it's a hard plastic tube and it only goes as far back as just behind your tongue. And that just keeps your tongue from falling back into the back of your throat 
It allows you to breathe comfortably and passively when you're deep asleep under sedation. So we use those a fair amount. What we don't use very much is a breathing tube or intubating patients. When I say very much, we don't use it at all. We have, we have the ability, but our plan is to never intubate anybody. And so a breathing tube is different. It's a tube that goes all the way down behind the back of the tongue into the voice box, through the voice box, into the windpipe. And if you have ever swallowed something the wrong way, a little drink of water or inhaled something the wrong way, and you get into a huge coughing fit, you will know how sensitive the inside of your voice box and trachea are. They're super sensitive. So for you to have this tube sit in your mouth, in your throat, in your voice box, and in your trachea, and tolerate that and not complain about it, not cough and buck and that kind of stuff, your brain has to be very asleep. It requires a deep level of anesthesia to keep that happening. Interestingly, that is way more asleep than I need you to do my facial surgery because I have everything done with lidocaine. So if we intubate you, for me, it's a, it's a bit of a struggle because one, the breathing tube is sitting right in my way and it's a, especially when I'm doing neck work or nose work, this tube right here is a challenge. Two, we're giving you way more anesthetic than you actually need because you have to be sleepy enough to tolerate the breathing tube. Everything else is numb with lidocaine. It doesn't hurt. When there's no breathing tube, I just have to have you sleepy enough that you're comfortable, you don't feel anything, you don't remember anything. If I poke outside the anesthetic field, the person would actually stir. So we have them very light. That's an, that's an excellent thing. Um, there is a thing called a laryngeal mask airway, which is somewhere in between an oral airway and a breathing tube. We don't use those either. We use strictly oral airways if the patient needs them. Um, but there is kind of an in-between. I'm just going to mention it so that you know we're thinking about it. Now, one particular advantage that breathing tubes do have is they have what's called a cuff, which is this looks like a marshmallow on this diagram, but it's a balloon right here around the sides of the tube. And in theory, if you have fluid in the back of your throat or that kind of thing, it can help prevent that fluid from going down into the lungs. And so one thing that I sometimes get asked is, isn't it better to have a protected airway, um, a cuffed breathing tube when you're doing facial surgery? And my answer is, well, it can be, and it can also be worse. So once again, you need to be deeper to have that protected airway. But then two, it's honestly not always necessary. And so, you know, it's kind of like wearing a helmet when you're in the car. Isn't it better to have a helmet on when you're driving in your car? Well, I mean, I guess yes, in theory, but there are certain circumstances where you want it. If you're a race car driver, a helmet makes sense. If you're a motorcycle driver, a helmet makes sense. Day to day in the car, I don't think a helmet is necessary. And truthfully, the kinds of facial surgery that I do are blood loss inside the mouth and nose and nasal cavity is negligible. It's minimal. And so we, we I mean, if you've seen some of my rhinoplasty videos, they're usually dry, dry, dry. And so I don't, I, for 15 years, I haven't used a cuffed breathing tube and I do a ton of facial surgery and I have a lot of peers and colleagues across the country that do it the same way. And so, um, you know, it's a question I get asked a lot. It's honestly not a concern. I think that having you deep enough to tolerate that tube comes with its own consequences. So that's a point where there may be some controversy, um, but this is how I do it. And I'm telling you everything I know. So I've kind of alluded to this. What I like in my office is opioid free, meaning there's no, uh, fentanyl, there's no morphine, there's no Demerol, that class of medications has a high likelihood of making you sick to your stomach after surgery. Um, it's got kind of some withdrawal side effects after surgery I don't like. So opioid-free deep sedation. And so what I like about it is it controls anxiety, pain, restlessness. We do use benzodiazepines, things like Versed, that help make you calm um, and help give you a little bit of amnesia if you need it. Um, we do use propofol, which is a very titratable drug. You know, if you're a little sleepy, we can back it down. If you're a little too aware, we can turn it up. Um, but we don't use narcotics. And what I like about this, again, is it um, gives you everything you want. It gives you the relief from anxiety, the relief from pain, the relief from rest restlessness, um, and minimizes the negatives that are associated with inhaled anesthetics and narcotics. Both of those are much more likely to be nauseating and have withdrawal side effects and that kind of stuff. So anesthesia safety or surgical safety. 
let's start by saying, how do we create a safe environment? Um, we obviously, we can't, there's, there's no hospital or surgery center or surgeon's office in the country that can say perfectly safe guaranteed, right? But we can do everything that's responsible. And how do we know we're doing everything that's responsible? We invite outside accrediting bodies to come check our work. And so the one we use is called the Accreditation Association for Ambulatory Healthcare. Um, they do my office, they do surgery centers, they do hospitals, and there's two or three of these organizations. This is the one that we're with. And they come through and they look at our records, they look at our policies, they look at our procedures, they quiz our staff, they, they go through all our sterilization logs, all our uh, emergency equipment, um, all of our maintenance logs, and they make sure that we're doing the type of job that is done at the national level. So it's not just us saying, take our word for it, we're trying to keep you safe. We invite this group to come in and survey us. And we're actually technically liable to a surprise audit at any given time by either the state or this group. And uh, we haven't had one yet, but we will someday. And I feel very confident that just like we've passed every planned audit, we would pass a surprise audit. So knowing that we're doing everything right, what's, what comes in with that? So let's talk about managing risks. So the biggest thing you can do to manage risk is not operate on a high risk patient. So that's the biggest thing you can do. So we, in my office, are accredited to operate on ASA physical classification one and two. So what is one? ASA one means a completely healthy patient, non-smoking, doesn't use alcohol, doesn't take any prescription medications. You know, your average 16 year old, super healthy. ASA two is a patient with mild systemic disease. What would that be? I have high cholesterol, but that's about it. Or high blood pressure, but you know, either of those, you're taking your medications for them and they're under control. Interestingly, a social alcohol drinker ends up being an ASA 2 category. So ASA 2 can be a really broad category. So ASA 2 can be anything from perfectly healthy triathlete that drinks alcohol once in a while, has high blood pressure, takes his pills. That's an ASA 2, super healthy. Um, but an ASA 2 could also be someone with mild lung disease or uh, oh, really heavy, you know, body mass index of 35, 38, something like that. That's technically an ASA 2. But in my opinion, those are two completely different risk categories. So ASA 2 is a huge category. I will only operate on the healthy, healthier parts of ASA 2. ASA 3 is, is, is more unhealthy. They, these people really shouldn't be considering cosmetic surgery. They're the ones that have a health condition that intermittently flares up and interferes with their quality of life. You know, they get chest pain once in a while, or they have asthma attacks so bad it lands in the hospital once in a while. Um, ASA 4, 5, and 6, you didn't want to go there. ASA 4 is they're constantly in the middle of a health crisis. ASA 5 is they're expected to die in the next 24 hours. And ASA 6 is they're already brain dead and they're an organ donor. So really, 1s and very healthy 2s are the only ones that we'll take in my office. Um, so that's the first thing you can do to manage risk. Second thing, you want to make sure your patient's a non-smoker. So I insist on two months of non-smoking status. One, because of the nicotine. I don't want any nicotine products of any sort. So uh, nicotine vapes, nicotine patches, nicotine gum, they're all off limits. Um, I don't even want really vaping or smoke to say marijuana, things where you're getting your lungs foreign bodies and particulates and irritants. I want that stuff off for a couple months. Um, and then I'm really strict on my BMI criteria. I want a BMI of 33 or under. And so technically ASA 2 goes all the way up to BMI of 40. But if I'm doing these under sedation and they're breathing for themselves, a really heavy patient is not optimal. So I want a BMI of 33 or less. And not only that, we use our mind, we use our brain when we look at a BMI of 33 or less. What does that mean? Well, some people with a BMI of 33 may carry all of their weight in their hips and they're going to breathe great under anesthesia. Other people with a BMI of 33 may carry all of their weight on their chest and belly and they're going to breathe terribly under anesthesia. So just because you squeak in at a BMI of 32.9 doesn't mean that I'll think you're a safe candidate because if you're a 32.9, you carry all your weight on your chest and upper abdomen. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put you under sedation because you're very unlikely to breathe comfortably. And then we're going to be in this trap. We either had to have you alert enough that you're breathing, but then you're aware and I don't want that. 
or you have to have you sleepy enough that you're comfortable, but then you're not going to breathe through your boil because there's too much weight on your chest. That kind of person needs to go to the hospital, needs to go to a surgery center, needs to be under general anesthesia. I don't do that anymore. That's that honestly, to me, that's a health category. It's just not even worth operating on because there's, there's too much risk involved. So I'm really picky. I operate on the healthiest of the healthiest people. Then there's some other little factors. If you can't open your mouth really wide, you have a bad TMJ and you can only open your mouth a finger or so wide, well, we, that person shouldn't be having sedation because God forbid you slip into a general anesthetic state and we need to put a breathing tube in, which again, in almost 20 years, we've never had to do that. Um, if you can't open your mouth very wide, that, that, that could create a risky situation. So if your blood pressure is under poor control, if your oxygen levels at baseline are under poor control, these are the kinds of things that are kind of, you have to use your common sense as well in terms of picking safe candidates. Um, what else do we do to keep you safe? Well, we do pre-procedure preparation. So routine labs, we're checking that your kidney function, your blood counts, and your clotting cell counts are all normal. Um, if you're 50 or over, we also get a routine EKG. This is kind of standard across the industry. Um, and we require no blood thinner. We require you to avoid blood thinners for two weeks leading up to surgery. So that's aspirin, Motrin, Aleve, vitamin E, fish oil. We'll give you a detailed list and we'll drill them into you. Um, we also ask and require that you avoid all supplements for two weeks leading up to surgery. And why is that? Well, because supplements, they're often very proprietary. You know, it's their special blend of these herbs and these, their special blend of these things. And although they're all natural, they have not been studied extensively to know, do they interact with anesthesia? Do they thin the blood? Uh, do they have unintended consequences? And because the supplement industry is not super, super tightly controlled, they can change their ingredients or have different ingredients in there. You might have gotten away with it one time. The next time you take that supplement, it's got something else in it. And so in the interest of safety, we say no supplements for the two weeks leading up to surgery because we don't want to find new drug interactions that we didn't know about. So it may sound a little crazy, but that's what we require. On the day of surgery, what can we do for keeping people safe? Well, one, nothing to eat or drink. Nil per Oz. You probably hear NPO here and there. Nil per Oz. Nothing by mouth. Um, we, re we request that, require that midnight the night before surgery. The only exception is when you come in, we often have you take your morning medications, um, your normal morning home medications, unless we've asked you to stop them, you'll take them with a tiny sip of water. We may give you a couple pills at the office to take, you'll take them with a tiny sip of water. Um, we will do a nicotine test to make sure you're, actually it's a cotinine test, but to make sure that you're compliant with the no smoking thing. We'll test for pregnancy because, you know, one small will capture pregnancy at the last second. And these days we're testing for COVID as well. Um, in a couple days leading up to surgery. If for some reason that didn't happen, we're going to test you in the office. We have a way to test in the office um, because it has been shown that if you have COVID within seven weeks of surgery, if you have a positive COVID test in the seven weeks leading up to surgery, um, there's a higher risk of surgical complications so or anesthesia complications. So um, we don't want a positive COVID patient having surgery for their own sake. So those are the kinds of tests that we do on the day of surgery. Now, during surgery, we do things that are intended to keep you safe. So one is we make sure that you have no piercings, no metal of any sort, because we use electrical devices, electric cautery. We don't want things drowning out. So come in with no piercings in, please. Uh, my poor nurses have had to remove piercings that you just can't even imagine. So please come in with no piercings in. Uh, we want no nail polish. Now, modern SAT monitors can sometimes read through nail polish, but sometimes they can't. And we need to be able to read the color of your nail bed with a little light that clips on. And that's how the, the anesthesia machine can tell how much oxygen your blood is carrying. And if you have a nail polish that they can't read through, well, then that's going to make it hard for us to monitor. So we want no nail polish and at least a few of your fingers. Um, as we get you ready to go to sleep, we're going to position you in such a way that your, your joints are in a safe position. Your pressure points are padded. This is not the exact picture, but this, I just, I just recently bought this table and it's a, I'm just going to say it's a $38,000 table. It's crazy, but it puts people in a very comfortable anatomic position. Um, and then we obviously use padding and straps and all the things to keep you super safe. And then we even go through every hour we have an alarm set and we come through and check your pressure points and make sure you are still in the right position. And it's a, it's a thing that we do at least every hour when the alarm goes off.
to make sure that we're not having you sit with a nerve compression or a bad joint position or something like that. Um, so why we have to do all this? Because your protective reflexes are stunted or, or dulled when you're under anesthesia. So we need to be your protective reflexes. We're taping your eyes shut. If we're not working on your eyes, we're looking at your pressure points, all that kind of stuff. We're keeping your body temperature appropriate. We use uh, pneumatic compression stockings. They're called sequential compression devices that squeeze your calves and kind of keep the blood moving. Helps minimize the rate of blood clots. Interestingly, intravenous sedation has a lower rate of blood clots than general anesthesia with the breathing tube. Why is that? Because general anesthesia with the breathing tube your blood vessel walls relax more and there's more stasis of blood flow. And when we have people under sedation, their vascular tone is better. They have a lower chance of blood clots. So I, it's another reason that I really strongly prefer intravenous sedation to general anesthesia. Now, once we have you asleep and you're in good position and you're padded and your eyes are protected and your nerves are protected, we still have work to do to keep you safe during surgery. And so this is a typical anesthesia monitor, and these are the types of things that get measured either continuously, meaning without breaking, or continually, meaning every so many minutes, during anesthesia. So up on the top there, the green, that's your pulse rate and one lead of your EKG, and that's continuous. That's measured all the time. Similarly, the blue, that's oxygen saturation. Out of 100% possible oxygen saturation, how much are we keeping your oxygen level up during surgery? So we measure that continuously as well. We also measure that yellow subsection there that's called end tidal CO2. And ours is qualitative because we don't have a closed circuit, but the idea is you can see those peaks and valleys in the yellow line. Those represent that you're breathing and moving air effectively. And so in my anesthesia program, my anesthetists, they obviously can't be up at the face because I'm up at the face. They can't be here at the face like when there's doing a knee surgery and the surgeon's all the way down there, airway is paramount in anesthesia. And so they have to be able to see, to be comfortable that the patient is breathing comfortably. Now, obviously they're listening, we're listening. I'm right there at the face the whole time, but it's very reassuring to see that continuous CO2 trace going up and down represents the patient's breathing. So that's really helpful. And then the purple there in the bottom corner, that's blood pressure. And that's continual. Every five minutes, we record your blood pressure and test and record and treat as appropriate. So that's kind of the type of thing that is traditionally monitored in an operating room. Now, this next part is a little controversial. I love my BIS monitor. So BIS monitor stands for bispectral index. Um, it is basically a way to read the brain waves, read the electrical energy in your brain, just these little stickers, they don't, they don't poke through, but they read the brain waves and then calculate from that what's called a bispectral index value. And that value gives you some sense of how awake or asleep your cortex, the, the, the human layer of your brain is. So if you think of the brain stem that controls your pulse and your blood pressure and respirations, that's all kind of like the reptile brain. And then like your cortex is where your awareness lives and what makes you really human. This machine helps measure to a degree how alert and awake that cortex is. And why is that important? In the old days, we would only watch pulse and blood pressure and respiratory rate and the patient's motions or flutterings of the eyes or that kind of stuff and say, oh, their pulse is going up, their blood pressure is going up, um, they're a little restless, we need to give them more medication to keep them sleepy, they're getting light. Um, or similarly, we'd see their pulse and blood pressure drifting down and say, oh, they're a little too deep. We need to, need to lighten them up, you know, get rid of some of their medication. Um, well, this bispectral index gives us, albeit a flawed number, it's not perfect, but we can watch the trend on this bispectral index. And if the patient's vital signs are completely calm, the pulse and blood pressure is not changing, the respiratory rate's not changing, but we see this bispectral index trace go higher and higher and higher over two, three, five, 10, 20 minutes. We know they're going to startle. They're going to start forming awareness. So we want to catch them before that. So we can titrate our medicines up a little bit, even without seeing any outward signs and get them back into a sleepier region. Similarly, they may look perfectly comfortable. Their pulse and blood pressure are stable, but we see that bi bispectral index number tracking down as a trend over time. Well, we know we're giving them more medication than we need. We can back off on the medication before we inadvertently get them too sleepy. 
So I like to say it's kind of like a thermometer. You have it in a pan of water and you have the water on the heat. And wouldn't it be nice if you got warning before the water started to simmer or boil? Or if you put that in the freezer, if you got warning before the water turned to ice, that's the thermometer. And it gives you your way to say, oh, heat them up, cool them down a little bit before you have to get to the points where they're alert and you don't want them alert or too asleep and you don't want them too asleep. So that's the bispectral index. I love it. Um, you'll see every time you watch a surgical video with home patients, you're going to see stickers on their forehead. That's what they're doing. Now, people often worry about intraoperative awareness. And even under general anesthesia, no reputable anesthesia provider is going to guarantee no intraoperative awareness. But with the bispectral index, with the right medications, with a little bit of amnestic on board, almost nobody has any intraoperative awareness. And if they do, it's fuzzy, trippy, dreamy. It's nothing bad. Um, the one condition that a lot of people worry about is that they'll be wide awake, feeling pain and unable to say anything. That really only happens when muscle relaxants are used. When you have a muscle paralytic, muscle relaxant on board, you could theoretically be in that situation where your brain's not asleep, but you can't move because you have a muscle relaxant on board. Well, we don't use any muscle relaxants at all in my practice. So um, that condition is, you just can't have that condition where you're wide awake, but can't say anything. So. That if that makes you feel any better, that's a, that's a fear that a lot of people have, and that's just not technically possible with the way we do anesthesia. So that, that's a nice thing. So going past the surgery, how does anesthesia impact your recovery? Well, one thing that people really worry about for good reason is nausea and vomiting. That's a horrible thing, and especially after delicate facial surgery, it's the last thing you want to do is be throwing up and retching and that kind of stuff. Well, the most common drugs to give you nausea and vomiting, one are opioids. So again, fentanyl, Demerol, uh, that kind of stuff, Remifentanil. Next is inhalational anesthetics. Well, we don't use either one of those. You're not exposed to either of those poisons. Now, patients often say, well, I'm fine as long as they give me that stuff in my IV. And they mean on Dancitron or Zofran, which is kind of the antidote, helps minimize nausea. So the best way to prevent getting poisoned by opioids or inhalational gases and throwing up is not to give you the antidote. It's actually not to give you the poison. So we don't give you those two poisons. We do still give the antidote because some people still get sick for random reasons, especially brow lifts can be a little nauseating. Um, so we still give the antidote, but more importantly, we're avoiding the poison in the first place. And it sounds too easy, but that's, that's the secret. Um, after you do emerge from anesthesia, though, you're in our recovery room. Our recovery nurse will be watching you until you've met all the standard Alderidi score criteria, eight or better. Um, and at that point, we are uh, we are going to discharge you home with your capable, physically well-bodied adult helper. And why is that? Well, you're still a little sleepy. You could still be a little unsteady. That's very common. You need an able-bodied adult helper. To take you home it can't be your 85 year old mother with the tennis balls on her walker we have had someone show up like that before and we can't have that it has to be someone that can help you get to the bathroom and back someone that can be your physical helper someone that can help you keep track of what medications you've taken and haven't taken someone that can call me if there's a problem and bring you back to my office or god forbid take you to the hospital it has to be an actual adult helper with you um similarly you're kind of goofy and sleepy you can reach up and mess up your nose. You can reach up and scratch your eye. So you're, you're a little goofy, sleepy. You need a helper with you for that first night. And I get a lot of pushback on that. You know, can't, can they drive me off at home and then go, my neighbor just lives next door. The answer is no, you have to have a helper with you the first night. It's, it's the only responsible way. Now the day after surgery, clear minded, as long as you're not taking excessive pain medication or that kind of stuff. And to the point of pain medication, um, we do a lot of things during surgery that prevent pain after surgery. So one I mentioned a little while ago, injecting long-lasting numbing, med long numbing medications. Two is we we prevent what a lot of people call the nociceptive windup, and that's a, uh, a little bit of a controversial phenomenon. But if your body is asleep, your brain's asleep, uh, but feeling pain, it gears up that adrenaline, that nervous system, the pain set, the pain sensing sympathetic nervous system. So that after the surgery, it potentiates your, your, your ability to feel pain. It makes you hurt worse than you would otherwise. If during the surgery, you don't feel any pain at all, 
because we've used adequate lidocaine to make all the tissues numb. And not only that, we use ketamine before our lidocaine, so you're actually dissociated when lidocaine goes in. Your brain doesn't even feel the lidocaine going in. So your brain experiences no pain at all during the surgery, none. And so if you have a restful nap with no pain during the surgery, there's no narcotics wearing off, giving you a narcotic withdrawal, um, and the tissues are numb when you wake up, the, the comfort level after our surgery is remarkably different than it used to be when I did surgery under general anesthesia, didn't use long lasting numbing and didn't dissociate with ketamine. Those things have changed, changed our patient's lives. So, um, anyway, as long as you're not taking heavy duty pain pills and that kind of stuff, the day after surgery, you should be fine taking care of yourself. The night of surgery, you have to have a capable, physically able adult helper with you. So final topics wrapping up. Um, I get a lot of questions about MD anesthesia versus CRNA anesthesia. Both are perfectly capable and qualified. I prefer CRNA anesthesia for a couple of reasons. Um, one, there is a cost advantage and people ask about that and it is true. But more importantly, a nurse anesthetist is operating under my license and with my orders and I am super picky. And I, I hate to say it, I like to be able to say 25 ketamine or you know, get them deeper, get them sleepier. And the nurse anesthetist is used to working in that relationship, collaborating with a physician, and it's perfectly appropriate. Um, and that may sound a little egomaniacal, but that's how I like to operate. If I, and the nurse anesthetists are typically very receptive to that. Doesn't mean that anesthesiologists can't be, but I've found the nurse anesthetists to be very receptive. The other thing is under sedation, um, we are watching all these monitors, the BIS monitor, the vitals monitor, but we're also watching just subtle signs and cues and, and body language of the sleeping patient. And don't want to start a fight. In my personal experience, um, my nurse anesthesia providers have been more attuned to those subtle cues and seem to do better with me with sedation. And that's just something that it's been, you know, 15 plus years now. That's um, the type of anesthesia provider that I have, I have really gravitated towards. Um, I have some patients that absolutely want an MD anesthesia provider. Um, they're going to have to go to a different doctor because I, I just don't leave my office anymore. I have the dream set up in my office. I have an operating room that is purpose built to facial cosmetic surgery. I have duplicate instruments of everything. So when I go to a hospital, they don't have half the instruments I have and they have one of them and they're dull. You know, if I drop something on the floor, I have four more I can open up because I'm the guy making the decisions as to what gets purchased in my office. So it's great. I have my exact first assistant that's been with me since 2007. So what is that now? 14 years. My scrub tech, my post-op nurse, they are all specifically trained for facial surgery. So when I leave my office, my quality of care goes down. I don't have the same level of care for my support team and for my physical plant when I leave the office. So if a patient absolutely insists on being in a hospital environment or if they need to be in a hospital environment because they're medically unwell, I'm not their surgeon. I operate exclusively in my accredited center at this point, my accredited office based suite at this point. Um, emergency preparedness, we do our advanced cardiac life support training every year. As a matter of fact, it's coming up this Wednesday for us. Um, you really only need to do it every other year, but we do it every year. And why is that? We do it every year because we, we don't use it. So we have to be refreshed more often. Um, and so we go above and beyond to make sure that we're up to date with that. So I've done advanced cardiac life support training now, I'd say 25 times. It started annually in residency. I've kept it up since then. Um, every one of my nurses does it. My All my anesthesia providers do it. Um, and so it's, I think that's important. We obviously have all the equipment. Um, the one thing that people ask about a lot is malignant hyperthermia. That is a familial condition. Um, where people can have horrible reactions to specific anesthetics. Those anesthetics, muscle relaxants, inhalational gases, we don't have either of those around, or depolarizing muscle relaxants and inhalational gases. We have neither of those around. We have no risk of malignant hypothermia. So that's fantastic. Another thing that people sometimes ask about, much less commonly, is long term sequela of surgery or of anesthesia. Well, does it increase dementia or does it increase some kind of mental dysfunction later? My answer to that is it hasn't been proven to be the case, but there are some studies that do suggest 
that anesthesia may in some ways impact that. If it does, you want the least anesthesia possible. And that's what we can do with intravenous sedation, avoiding most classes of drugs, and using that BIS monitor to have you just under the surface of consciousness as opposed to down at the bottom of the ocean. So I don't think there's a whole lot behind the, the concept of dementia and anesthesia tie-ins, but if there is, wouldn't you want the least potential, least possible amount of medication to get the procedure done safely and comfortably? I certainly would, and that's how we run it. So that was a long presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. If you have questions for me, please leave them below. I know it's going to stir up some controversy, but these are just my honest opinions.